Yeah? Good. All right, I'm Kevin Goodman, and we're going to talk about layering today. Those of you who may or may not know me, I was with RTO Software, and uh, we'd had a couple of products, Virtual Profiles, and another one called T-Scale, which Citrix OEM'd a million and a half years ago. I also wrote the foreword to this book. Who has this book? Any of y'all? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, tweet that up and say, Jack Madden said, free books for everybody in this session. Oh wait, no, don't even bother. Tweet it up and say, Brian Madden said, free books for everybody in this session. So. Oh, yes. Did you hear the cartwheel story? All right, right before we get started, cartwheel story. Brian said, the camera can follow you anywhere these days. It's much better than previous Bry forums. Look, I can do my Paul Moritz imitation. I don't know if he's going to be at VMworld for his last one. So we were the guy who did this and that and everything. And Brian said, you could do that you want if you want to. You could even do cartwheels. So who raises his hand and goes, I'll give 100 bucks to the first buy who does a cartwheel? And every single one of the session preventers raised their hands. So I said, oops, that was dumb. So right after Brian's keynote, I went and um, did a cartwheel so I could be the first one. <laughs> anyway, so let's move on. Show of hands, IT guys, we talking to admins here? All right, any end users? No? One, two, anybody resellers? Okay, okay. Do you include those of you who are managing desktops physical in that mix? How about that thing? And I got accused of being a VDI hater. I'm not a VDI hater. I just, let's get that straight in the context of this presentation here. I know I wrote the Ford and Brian's VDI delusion book, but I'm not a VDI hater. I just think it's only appropriate in certain use cases. And try to force it down the throat of use cases where it's not appropriate leads to pain and anxiety to my favorite kind of people, people who support users in the virtual desktop physical world. Who's been here before? I heard a name for this in another session. You, you're called Bryformers, people who were in Bryform prior to this one. Uh, last question. So of you who are doing VDI, how many are doing it in production at scale? There you go. Let the record show there's a good 10 out of the 150 people that are in the room. <laughs> OK, what do we mean by when we say layering? I just, Tap it into Google, read that, and go home, I guess, yeah? It is the last session of the day. Well, there is no definitive word for this in Google with respect to what the vendors are calling layering. As a matter of fact, vendors get in arguments with each other about what is and what isn't a layer. I'm going to do my best shot here to say what I think layering is. Separating into logical places by filtering. An image, your gold image, taking pieces out of it and separating them, maybe into the operating system, your applications, and all your user stuff. Does that sound sort of what you were expecting to hear when you came in here about what layers are? I want to go into the interpretation of how they do that and what techniques they use under the covers. You don't have to be a programmer to understand any of this stuff. I'm going to, I used to be a coder, so if I get in coding and I look and you look like you're not understanding it, I'm trying to helicopter up into uh, user land. Image management. Trying to simplify the way we get our desktops to users is one of the reasons for layering. 
figuring out licensing. It's such a big pain in the neck to try to do licensing for your entire user base when only a portion of your user base is using a particular application. Why spend to have it on a disk when that particular user isn't going to be running that application? How do you get upgrades out to these users? How do you, how do you get them to install and things like that is another reason. How do you roll back if you didn't like that first version that you stuck out there or that upgrade that you stuck out there? These are all what I think are good reasons for layering. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a disconnected use case as well. I may have to stand back here if this doesn't work anymore. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Uh -huh. All right, I already talked about reducing licensing costs, simplifying app release. These are, are things here. This one is the one that I think most of you are concerned with, maybe. If you think about layering, just getting rid of the image sprawl that's come upon us these days as we create different, uh, one of the vendors calls it departmental apps. Actually, there's four or five vendors in here, and. And my goal of this presentation uh, at, at the end of today is when you talk to those vendors, you'll be able to ask the questions and you'll have the understanding of how this software works and these techniques work so that you can make a decision as to whether you've got the right layering solution, how you can improve it, or if you're still choosing a layering solution, which one to choose. Uh, uh, question, who's implementing layering right now from one of the vendors that's probably here at Bryform? What do you have, sir? Unidesk. A Unidesk here? Hey, I, I can't tell you. All right, all right, that's fine. Someone else raise their hand in the back. Okay, so we got Symantec, uh, we got Unidesk, and we've got one other. Okay. So, all right. The question was, what portions am I yeah. talking about layering? There's a lot of layers. So I'm talking about the ones that make up your disk image. Okay. Is there other layering you'd like me to cover? Um, not at all. No. Oh, okay. Is, does that cover it? Yeah, the, yeah, work, oh, so the question was, could, could I use something like SMS to do this as well? Yeah. Anybody agree with that? Industry standard for layering? You know, they all follow the National Institute of Layering Standards, and you can be sure as you go from one to the other, you're gonna get a consistent use of terminology, use of, yeah, I know, yeah. So, I've looked at them last year at this conference, uh, Gabe and I, did a user installed apps presentation. And as a midst of that presentation, we looked at several of these vendors and, and we got demonstrations for some of them. And I got a little bit of an idea of how they create these layers. So let's, uh, let's break it down into two pieces. You have an admin who wants to create the original layer. So filter, separate his base image into pieces, OS, apps, personalization, layers. And then users, when they're running their desktop, unbeknownst to them, are triggering this layering. So they're reconstituting the desktop as it gets brought up and they start doing their work. User can read, applications, registry settings. Users also write, which may go back out into a layer like the personalization layer their application saves, configuration changes, and the like.
So far, so good? Okay. So, we're going to go into a little bit of programming here. Um, judge the... I'm, I'm, I'm looking for audience reaction. There's only one programmer in the place here. So we have the co-create layer instance API, right, Tim? And you pass in a vendor layer, either Winova, RingCube, Mocha 5, Unidesk. Uh, uh, the uh, semantic V layers is actually called SWS. Is that pretty much it? Yeah, yeah, it should have been. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm fucking with you. There's no such thing. There's nobody does anything like this. I just, it's the last day of the conference, and uh, that was the old prices right thing where you, when you got uh, booted off the game show there. Thank you for playing the prices right. There'll be lovely door prizes as you walk out the door. All right, so. I had to go do some researching on how they do this stuff. What I'm saying is when the developers of these layering products go out there and they implement their layering, they're free to do it any way they desire, as long as they come up with an achieved result. And let's look at some of the ways they did that. First of all, anybody know who this guy is? He might very well be, in my opinion, the fathering of all layering. He wrote Regmon, Baumann, co-founded Sys Internals with a guy named Bryce. Does anybody know his name? Shikaka. All developers do the Tebow when they hear that name. You're correct, Mark Racinovich. Shikaka. Okay, so, so, I went to this class, before I knew his name, before the Windows internals book came out, I went to this class in Dallas with he and that guy Solomon, I think his name is David Solomon, the co-writers of this book. It was myself and a room full of people from Microsoft. This is when he was still at Sys Internals. A room full of people from Microsoft support group. And they were there how to learn, how to use, Falman, Regmon, David Solomon went through a couple of chapters that ended up in the book. And then they took a break and they said, when we come back, we're going to go over reverse engineering. They didn't come back. Not a single one from Microsoft came back. It was just me with this guy named Mark Racinovich. Shakaka. And I sat down one-on-one -on -one with this guy for two hours on how he reverse engineers, how he figured this stuff out, and how he does this stuff. That is why I genuflect whenever I hear his name. All right? Not this jackass. He is not the father of layering. Everybody thinks, oh, it was some hacker went in there and figured it out. Some hacker got in there because what they want to do is fool you into thinking you're writing in this location, but we're intercepting it and bringing it in that location. No, this guy, here, what'd he do? He gave away the source to Falman and Regmon. So guys like me could go in there and look at it and go, ooh, I didn't know you could do that. Pretty cool. You can bet some of these things ended up in my product, T-Scale. <laughs> you bet. All right. And they are, in fact, two pieces to Falman and Regmon. You might not notice this because he does his trick where he embeds a device driver into Filemon and Regmon, extracts it out of the resources, and then starts it up. So you don't even see the device driver. I guess you could look in Filemon and see the device driver, but typically you don't notice it's there. And I deliberately point out the kernel mode device drivers, because that's going to be an important part as we go through this thing. Oh. Pet peeve alert, pet peeve alert. We'll, we'll wake up the guys next door. Pet peeve alert, pet peeve alert. It pisses Kevin Goodman off every time people use user mode and kernel mode incorrectly. I think there's one more of those. Let's move it on. I 
I would go to the vendor booths, I would hear back from my salesman. Oh uh, yeah, you don't, you, don't, you don't want to use virtual profiles. Their solution uses a kernel mode driver, and that means it's in every single app. Well, everything in kernel mode's in every single app. It's not like there's a kernel mode per app, separate kernel modes per app. Of course it's in the app. So is the file system, by the way, you know, things like that. That one bugs me. Oh, if it has a word driver in it, it must be kernel mode. Everybody knows that the spooler, when it hangs up, is because one of those kernel mode printer drivers is messing it up. Yeah, those are the same guys that say our virtualization solution does kernel mode because it does the printer drivers, right? Our service runs in kernel mode. That one bugs me the most. I'm sorry, it just bugs me, all right? You pull up Task Manager, you look over there, and it says System. That's the user context it's in, not whether it's in user mode or kernel mode, okay? I uh, don't you know if you remember this, but in 1922, in Egypt, they went into the pyramids, and they opened up King Tut's tomb, and they found this document right here, okay? So... <laughs> Uh, Microsoft's architecture for Windows has been the same. This one says 2006 on it. We should probably update it a little bit for Windows 7 and not think about a gene and just think about authentication. But when you're looking at this document here, the top half, user mode, bottom half, kernel mode, okay? Top half, user mode, bottom half, kernel mode, all right? User mode. There are applications, they have DLLs, they go through kernel user to do functions like message box or create windows and GDIs, so forth and so on. All right, see where the services are? User mode, thank you. Now here's the kernel mode stuff. In here is where you see your file systems, your file system filter drivers and your block drivers and things like that. This would be called kernel mode. There aren't any kernel mode systems other than this whole system right here. That's the only system you're getting, people, okay? So, let's further simplify it and say, like, once we log on, the authentication system isn't really running inside your application. You have all these applications, they're all talking to the same kernel mode down here, and that top application probably runs through its own DLLs, kernel 32 calls, NT DLL calls, ends up in the kernel, then ends up right back in the application. That same kernel services this application and that application. Now, once inside the kernel, the software that runs in there has, may have a different view of memory because this is a virtual memory system, but it's the same kernel. It's not like this kernel gets swapped out and the new kernel gets swapped in. It is the same kernel, all right? And Quite frankly, some go to this DLL and that DLL down here. They wander around inside the kernel before they come back as well. Okay? Answer? Someone? Kernel mode or user mode? So the guy that could rewrite the operating system has to jump up and answer it. All right, yes, of course it's user mode. They're all user modes. All right, reminded me of the time my grandmother was saying to my um, daughter when she was about two years old, and what's your name, little girl? And I went, it's Teresa. She goes, oh, thank you. I don't need you to answer. I wanted her to answer. All right. Again, just because. All right. Now back to our regularly scheduled Bry Forum session. Sorry for the diversion, but I may throttle somebody if they say that again. All right, where were we? We were back to this guy, okay? There was no in small part of teeth gnashing about the existence of FAMON and Regmon within Microsoft, okay? Mark used an API that they were hoping would remain internal or private or only to people who bought the file system 
developer kit, which was costing $10,000 plus or more back in those days. And here he is, he gives away the software, and any guy who can recompile it and change a few things in there, next thing you know, they've got an app out that does the same thing as FileMon or Regmon. So, there's a table inside kernel mode that holds, um, it's a data structure that holds this table and inside that table has all these kernel mode functions in it. What happens is you go into kernel, you look in this table, let's say you wanna do something at the registry. I wanna perform a registry action, I wanna query some registry item. We jump all the way down, remember we started application start up here, go through all these DLLs, end up in kernel mode. The IOS manager would then go and look in this table and find out where that item resided in memory. All right, here's some files that, just for argument's sake, registry and file function are in there, okay? So, Mark got the bright idea, why don't I edit this table? Instead of it pointing to reg, query, or ZW query inside kernel mode, why don't I point it to my function? My function will log what took place, then I'll send it back to the original function. The original function can go query the registry and return back to the user, right? Again, in kernel mode. Here's an example of it. So the kernel mode function to create a key when, when you call in user mode, create key, or you, you in reg edit and you go to create a new key, it does a Windows API call of this reg create key, ends up down in kernel mode as ZW create key, and I'll explain why it's ZW in a minute, but what'll happen is inside that KE descriptor table, you'll see this address, and Mark's program, Regmon, created a new function called myCreateKey, stored off the address to ZWCreateKey, and edited the table with the new address. So, you make that call, it goes to the IO manager, it goes to this table and says, oh, here I am at Baker 78 million, whatever that number is. I made those numbers up, I don't know what they really are. And myCreateKey gets control. He remembered where he had put the forwarding address, logged, sent it on to there. Very simple, right? It's a great idea. Effectively, Regmon's function works instead of the original one. Remember I said he did the source and everyone thought this was a great idea? Well, as long as it's only my create key out there, hey, things are awesome, baby. What if it's your create key out there? Oh, no. So what happens is he remembers yours and he goes and forwards it on. So actually, right now, we're still working. Everything's fine, right? There's just two of you on here. Until you want to stall your app. <laughs> then when he went to forward to uh, that forwarding address that he had saved, <laughs> You're not there anymore. Oh, that sucks. Hold on. Yeah, let's do that again. Okay. So, back in 2006, Microsoft added something called page protection to Windows Vista when it came out. They actually made it read only, this table, read only. One of the other Fascinating things about the kernel mode is if you're in there, you're considered protected code, you're allowed to write to all these address spaces. So Mark wrote some code in 32-bit land to create a new descriptor of the address, and this time read-write. So he got around all this work that Microsoft did to make it a read-only memory descriptor, okay? I say 32-bit LAN because in 64-bit LAN, you have hardware protection that can do this and you can't change it in software. Um, ever remember a certain application virtualization streaming app that the guy in the second row invented, um, not coming out with the 64-bit version for a long time? 
I always wondered as if it was because they were trying to figure out some of these page protection things that came in. I don't know. So, how do you stop this guy from doing all this stuff? You buy him. And then, once you buy him, he totally flips 180 degrees and writes rootkit revealer. Rootkit revealer goes into the KE descriptor tables and checks to see if they're identical to when Windows started. If not, it points an address, it picks out the address, finds whose kernel mode driver it belongs to, and says, ah, you're guilty. That's how all the rootkits uh, do this stuff. Okay, so now it's Microsoft Sys internals. SARS goes away to file mod and reg mod, and they come up with something called the registry filtering model. Started at this point, I noticed aggressively pushing something called PlugFest. PlugFest is where device driver writers can go together, sit in the same room, and put their software on the same box. So Microsoft provides you with boxes. A lot of times it's the beta operating system and the next uh, software that come out. And you and whoever else is there can get together and interop. Now, if you and the guy who had bashed the KE descriptor table had interop before, you would find out that you have problems when one guy uninstalls and, and, and stuff like that. But what they were really doing while they were there is hammering on you to get away from this method. We've withdrawn the source to FileMon and RegMon. We're going to do something else better for you. At this point, they lowered the price of the file system filter driver kit. I think it comes with MSDN now, or you can download it. Um, so you can create your own drivers much easier. All right, if the, all the bad stuff is published, why keep it a secret? Let's go get the good stuff and, and, and get you to do that. Uh, file filters at this point now, we're changing and Microsoft's really pressing you to use some of these new formats. There's uh, two types that I think the layering systems that are out there today are using, and that's uh, file and block uh, device drivers. Uh, if you th think of them in the stack, and if you remember that picture I showed, block or below file, and they're really just bits of files, indexes into the file for a certain period of time. I've never written a block driver, so I'm only going to refer to them uh, in a broad sense of the term. But if I'm a layering, I probably can do all this stuff, file, the result can be the same. Um, I should have asked, is any layering company representatives in here? Anybody? Uh, we, got, we got one in the back. Um, I think the new one that just got acquired by VMware is a block filtering mechanism. I think Unidesk is file mechanism. I'll go over the differences, not all that important. You just see how the results are at the end. You ever, you ever complain about how many reboots it takes once you install some stuff? Does that bother anybody? Bothers me, bothers me all the time. As a matter of fact, to get your Windows logo, I think starting with Windows XP, your software couldn't require a reboot. Yeah, like they could enforce that on everybody. Part of the problem was Microsoft. These filters, the, I mean these, yeah, these, these drivers that they were pushing on you, while they weren't as bad as this KE descriptor table, they're, still caused issues when you uninstalled them. So the only way to uninstall them was to force you to reboot and get you out of there. Around this time, Microsoft came up with something called the filter manager. It is a legacy device driver that loads other device drivers. Since it loads a device driver, it can unload it. It can do the patching that no one else could do. I imagine if sysinternals stayed sysinternals, Mark's next version of FileMom would have written a routine that said, hey, if someone comes after me, I'll go ahead and remember that so when the next guy in between us uninstalls, I'll patch the table back to the original guy and we won't get in this nightmare that we're in. Well, that's what the filter manager does. If only it was written by Microsoft, it's endorsed by Microsoft. 
The other thing that's cool about it is it supports a load order. I'm a uh, company that writes user environment management software. And there's a company that writes layering software, and we both want to be on the same system at the same time with that um, antivirus writer. What can happen is you can go to Microsoft and request something called an altitude. Where in the stack do I want to sit? Do I want to be before the virus writer, but after the layer? Do I want to be after the layer, but before the device driver? Well, I'm not sure I would know exactly when. That's what PlugFest is for. You go ask Microsoft, where do I belong in this stack? I Yeah, let me repeat the question. So this isn't something dynamic that Windows assigns to you when you load your device driver. This is something you go and request from Microsoft. I need an altitude. And there are several types of drivers. There's block drivers. There's in the filter, uh, the filter drivers that you write, file system filter drivers, the majority of the ones that are doing file-based call themselves activity monitors. And activity monitors all have a altitude that, that is very close to each other. And if I can get Exchange, I mean, uh, Excel, hold on a sec. Um, you can see a few of them in here. These are all right here. These are all altitudes of people who have, and you pull this down. That right there, um, the uh, screen from, because of the resolution here, see if I can. You can see RTO logon right there is what was virtual profiles driver. And you can see now it's renamed that, and it's owned by that company now, uh, for altitude. And you can see how these fit in here. And they, from lower to higher, is how they load. You Look in here, and you'll see in the filter driver SDK, they have a nice sample called Mini Filter, Mini Filter Spy, or something like that. If I'll bet you can go in here and find Mini Filter Spy's altitude. And if you look and see what your vendor's altitude is, and if it's the same as Mini Filter, then I'm, I've got a serious red flag coming up, but these guys aren't serious about writing file system filter drivers, all right? They took the sample, they made some changes, and now they're selling this commercially product. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm a little worried about that. I, I can tell you, I've looked in this list, and I've seen all the vendors that you'd see here today at um, Ryforum that are using filter drivers. So the, the one you mentioned, uh, the, the one from the gentleman who's sitting in the back of the room, and, and, and the other one that you mentioned. See if we can find any of them. Yeah, there's the semantic ones, Quest, Microsoft. That one on the bottom, Mini Spy, that's the one from Microsoft. If you're, if you notice someone has this altitude in there, then they just copied the, the sample program from Microsoft. And since this mini filter that you're plugging into, that's what they called it, they've renamed your old device driver legacy, your new device driver as a mini filter, since the filter manager, which is a legacy driver, is loading it, it also can unload it now. So you no longer need to require a reboot if you're using this new technology here. There's a big, switch statement, control statement, but like a big if, then, or else statement inside of all of the legacy filter drivers of all the items it's capable of doing. In file systems, that would be like you would expect a create, a read, and a write, a rename, a delete, technically, things like that. 
all right? In the old legacy filters, you got them, you signed up for them. Most of them you didn't use, and you put a pass-through routine on there, saying, yeah, nothing, keep going, go to the next guy. And they'd stack them up one on top of each other. Well, with um, the mini filters, the filter manager is still this legacy driver. He's still getting those, but you can choose whether you want them or not. Virtual profiles did not sit on the write chain, so it didn't ask to be notified when writes happened inside of uh, the, the mini filter. So um, in that particular case, all's well. Uh, sped things up tremendously. When there are blue screens in um, the filter driver software, what you used to do is you used to see every other guy that was on the stack, and if you had his symbols, his public symbols, you see his pass through routine, 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 pass through routine. It was just very inefficient. This new wave is much better. So that makes it easier on programmers. Whatever a stack is, many filters use less stack. Use too much stack in legacy filters, and you cause a blue screen. So the fact that they use less stack is a good thing. All right. Yeah. Any of you who's ever sit in this space right here, figuring out the file's name is pain in the butt. Can you imagine that? A pain in the butt, okay? So in memory is the 11 character name, you know, um, if resume.doc is in there, but figuring out that it's in C colon backslash users, you know, my documents, all of that information, was something that every legacy filter used to do on its own. And they don't have to anymore because now the filter manager does it for you. So it's a lot more efficient. All right. Okay. You know, that's great, Kevin. I'm not going to write one. Why are you telling me this? All right. There are ways to find out if your guy, ask your vendor, are you a legacy driver or are you a mini filter? If he's a legacy driver, you've got to seriously ask him why. All right. This was. Remember that document we dug out of the pyramids there? That was from 2006. Why are you still a legacy driver? Yeah. Not on camera. I can, I, can tell you, I can show you how to figure it out. Okay. Now they load the same as device drivers, so um, they look to you just like any other device driver. Uh, selective reread it. The cool thing about it too is you can get notified before an operation, before the file's created, or you can send it on down to the real file system driver and get a call back after it was created and get the, uh, the thing of the success. Did it succeed or not? And again, okay, tell your vendor, when they first came out, they weren't available on Windows 2000, this filter manager, but then they did a service pack. Then it was uh, on 2003. It's everywhere. It's on Vista Plus. There's no reason for not having them. And here's a nice, cute little picture of it. You see the many filters out on the right. What happens is, Joe, I haven't gotten with the program, still have a legacy filter, has to get stuck right in the middle of them, right here. So your filter can be before him and after him because he really doesn't have an altitude because they can't set it. All right, so what's the code look like for it? <laughs> Tim's looking at me. You wouldn't, code doesn't look like that. This is, this is an idea behind it, all right? So create the file. Is it one we're interested in? So use your little mini filter techniques to find out the file name. Let's say it's a document uh, in user mode, or it's a file from an application that I have layered, the operating system may think it's local. I double click on that uh, little icon, I may expect uh, Firefox.exe to load up and see program files, uh, um, Mozilla Firefox.exe, right? You get control here, and you can actually change the name to where it really is, which they call in the industry a reparse. You turn that reparse, and all of a sudden, all the other file filters believe that's where the name of the file is. That's how you can do some of the streaming stuff. If you're a block device driver, instead of the files, 
you do something similar, but instead of getting the entire file, you get pieces of it. And that's how you stream it down. The opposite's true for reads, right? So for a read, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd read it, I'd get the information, see if it's anything that I need, and then go ahead and return success on there if I needed it. So this does, um, for the activity monitors in the system, this means that each and every one of them uh, can go ahead and get that new file name and act on it and do its activity monitoring on that file as if that was the real file name. And so because of the filter manager getting that return code back of uh, status reports, he can then go back and call the post ops of all these other guys who registered to want to know about it. He'll also update the new name so that when you go and get the name, you'll get the correct one. All right, and you can see that these guys all can run based on what your altitude is. Yeah, so they get the correct name. Um, one of the reasons for PlugFest and doing this interop is, it's just an aside, status reports, when you return status reports, it doesn't look like an error. Microsoft set it up so way everything below zero looks like an error to you. Except status reports has some crazy uh, error code of like 108. So everybody in Interop who runs across a guy who's doing status reports gets the wrong file name and crashes. So you gotta go in there and say, oh yeah, you can't just test, check status success. You gotta check also if it's reports and, and figure out what's going on there. So that's another reason why you wanna know, did your vendor go to PlugFest? Hey, did you go to PlugFest? I would, I would ask those guys. Did you go to PlugFest? If they have an altitude, they probably do. All right? Gotta go. True story, I talked to the Symantec guys, and I said, man, I'd really love to interrupt with you. And they went, who are you? I said, well, I'm RTO software. We make this, uh, I never heard of you, no. <laughs> Arrogant sons of. Now, not the workspace streaming guys. The antivirus guys just said, no, okay. Well, why'd you even come here then if you didn't want to? So there's no guarantee that all the bugs will be out, but it's better than nothing. All right, so let's take a look at layer in the registry. Because I didn't want you to do registry the way Regmon did it, Microsoft came up with this CM register callback. They call it the registry filtering model. And in kernel mode, the registry is called the configura configuration manager. Consequently, that's why this is the CM register callback. And they're, they're kind of similar in concept to what we're doing here with the file system. You can get a, a look at the registry, you can decide if you want to read it or write it at that point in time. I think here are some, there's one, there's a pre and post for almost every single registry function out there that you can do. As you get to later and later operating systems, this functionality became, remember this is just Microsoft code that they introduced, um, well back on, you know, in 2000, it doesn't do pre-ops for a lot of these things. So no one's on 2000 anymore. That used to be the excuse that people would use why they're still doing the Regmon reasons, because this didn't work very good. So um, in a registry key, similar, let's take a look at it. All right, is this a key I'm interested in? So it comes in, it's uh, a user's installing, uh, administrators are installing an application. The application makes writes to HK local machine. I want to go ahead and layer those. My filter driver comes in with my CM register callback, hits my code on create key, and says, is this a key we're interested in? Well, if it's going to local machine, yeah, I'm interested in it. Well, then let's go ahead and copy that to our, wherever we're storing our filter. I wrote VHDs, because a lot of these guys still run VHDs. But let's go ahead and copy that layer there, all right? Now, 
out at the user's desk. She goes and opens the application. The application decides it needs to read from HK local machine. You can do the same thing in reverse. When you get hit with this uh, read of the key in here or on the create, to see if it exists, you go off to the VHD and see if it exists there first. If so, give the information back from that one. That's in a very simplified manner one way to do this redirection and layering. Make sense? Too fast? Questions? So all right, we had a comment um, from another Bri Forum presenter, um, Tim Mangan, in which he was saying, in some cases, writes are actually faster than they would be because they don't go to disk. They go out to memory first. And in that particular case, imagine later on you get a read. It reads it from memory first rather than going out to disk. So you can actually improve performance using some of these layering or application virtualization systems um, in that respect. Oh, OK, and so there was already a cache manager. And you have configuration management for the registry. If they had to do it over again, they call the registry something else. Even though it's a ZM register callback, the APIs all begin with ZW in kernel mode. So if I'm a kernel mode writer and I don't want to read from the registry, I've got to call an API that becomes with, begins with ZW. Uh, a little thing about Microsoft, they like to group all their um, APIs based on the routine. So the IO manager always begins with IO, IO create. The cache manager always begins with CM. And since the configuration manager is also CM, they had to come up with something else. Uh, so when you talk about CM register callback, no one immediately thinks of registry. Talk to your vendor and ask him if he's doing a CM register callback and he doesn't know what one of those is. He's probably a block driver, which is uh, lower. Block drivers wouldn't necessarily have to read from CM register callback. As you're writing bits down to the disk, they just take those bits and use a method similar of pushing them off. So your whole ntuser.dat would stay pristine inside the layer as opposed to getting pits and pieces of it. I think Winova's a block driver. Is anybody? I think. Now, I heard a discussion last night among Bryforum presenters in which one said they're not a layering solution because they're a block driver and only file system layering solutions are true layering solutions. Remember no industry standard about layering? What's the difference? They're storing the data somewhere else, putting it back at runtime so that you can get all those features we talked about earlier, you know, reduce your image sprawl and all those things. So if you're a block driver, then this isn't necessary. OK? So uh, let's put it all together. All right, so we've got a system administrator here. He's doing some layering. He installs an OS into a clean machine, would be one way to do it, and it gets written out. Then he installs applications, they'd get written out. And any configuration data or stuff like that, we could filter that as well. Then we take that. I've got a storage icon here. Does it really matter where the storage icon is? Eh, not really. You may be tied, some of the vendors are tied to virtualization systems. Other vendors work both physical and virtual. Be a, I, later on, I have a list of questions you'll want to ask your vendors when you get in there. Uh, I, Unidesk is uh, work on physical or just virtual desktops? Or do you know? I just virtual. Yeah, I, I think so, just virtual. All right, so um, 
Consequently, in, in the Unidesk case, this would be a VHD, is I think how they store those things. And if they support VMware, maybe it's a VMDK, I don't know. One of the big things about this is, right, you're trying to reduce complexity. Well, why have a copy of the OS for each and every user out there? Why not just have one? And why have a copy of each and every DL out, DLL out there? Why not just have one? This is what we call single instance storage. And some vendors are smart enough, when you're creating them and doing the writes, they recognize duplicate data and collapse it at that point in time. Um, I think that'd be really important, and uh, the only reason I bring up iTunes is because it seemed to me every single time a vendor did a presentation for me, they talked about a user installing iTunes, which is gigs and gigs of data in iTunes, apparently. So if that happens, you only want one copy of iTunes out there if they're all identical, or one copy of Firefox 13, or, or something else like that. Other vendors uh, are not this sophisticated yet, and what they tell you is turn on your SAN to just dedupe those blocks in the background, all right? There's a couple of cool vendors I saw here at, at, at um, the Bright Forum. Quick show of hands. How many of you guys went out and saw all the vendors? Well, or went out and saw the vendors. Did you go walk around? I get queried all the time because uh, I had a company here, I pres uh, presented, but I also bought a vendor spot here. Other vendors call me all the time. Is it worth it? One of the questions I said is, at Bryform anyway, I know at MMS no one goes to the vendor, but Bryform, pretty much you guys walk around and ask because the vendors bring, like, guys who can answer questions. <laughs> you know, I, my, I brought my developer, you know, when he was there, and the, the guy would ask the question, my developer would show him a piece of code. Yeah, yeah it sure does that, you know? Um, you know, kindred spirits, so yeah, I thought so. Well, I saw one um, storage place out there that was telling me that most people, and, and you can answer this question for me, the, the dedupe, if you make it work too hard, it takes up too much processing power on the SANs as well, so single instance storage would be preferable than letting your SAN do the dedupe, is that correct? I'm getting a couple of head shaking, yes, okay. Yeah, so, um, you know, I have a list of things. Are they single instance storage is one ask your layering vendor. Okay, runtime. All right, so we got uh, our user here, and she sits down uh, to boot up her, uh, or, or uh, hit enter on her thin client, desktop, virtual desktop, what have you. And voila, the agent from the layering company reconstitutes her desktop from those VHDs, okay? It goes out there and as it goes through the brute process, brings in the OS, brings in the applications, brings in the user persona, and one of the benefits that you hear from these guys is, you notice the only two particular apps she needed were Firefox and iTunes, well, that's the only two particular apps you're gonna bring in. Is why make her pay a license on Office if she's not using one? So since you have it in layers, you can separate those things out and get what you need to the right person. So here's the, the her side, right? The code inside the layer comes up and says, hey, is this a registry key we're interested? Yeah, go get it and make sure we get it the right one and override the um, registry key that already exists there with the one from the layer.
excellent point. So the, 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 the gentleman in the audience is, is, is in one way, um, let me see if I get you correct. I didn't mean to say that this all, these VHDs all had to sit on a sand somewhere in storage, but if you, there are some vendors who rely on the dedupe to do that. At runtime, if you have SSDs, you have these elsewhere, sure, then the, nothing in a layering system should preclude you from doing stuff like you're suggesting. It's just if, what you want to know is if while creating the layers, they support single instance storage. That will be a benefit. That's a pl in the plus column for that um, vendor. Is that sort of? Yeah. Okay. All right, and so, all right, one of the benefits, right, is the admin gets to update an individual layer. I can just go yank out the OS, put in Service Pack 3, and the next time you go to log on, you've got Service Pack 3. That is the promise of this layering, all right? So she starts back up, and without having to do anything, she gets the benefit of having Service Pack 3. Oh, the uh, elephant in the room. Okay. So far, all so far so good, huh? What do you do when there's conflicts? And let me tell you what I mean by conflicts, right? Admin updates an individual layer, Firefox 13, voila. We as a corporation have decided to, I'm not a Firefox user, I hope these versions make sense to you. We as a corporation have decided on Firefox 13, he goes through his whole process, he updates it in the layer, oh, but the user already has Firefox 14 installed. And Firefox 13, when she updates her layer, then does this. And all of a sudden your nice happy user is not nice and happy anymore, so you have a conflict and how you resolve that conflict, I've noticed, is different from vendor to vendor to vendor, okay? So, one thing you can do is you can warn the user. Um, I'm sorry, but the image has changed to Firefox 13. We notice you have a conflict. Firefox 14 may or may not work anymore. All right? You can warn the admin. That's how Unidesk works, I'm pretty sure. As he's creating the layers, he can say, I happened to notice when I was updating this, uh, this one VHD that they already had Firefox 14 installed, what do you want me to do? And the, the admin can decide, um, tough, they get 13. Or they can restrict that particular user from the update. Or you... You can set it up policy-based based on who they are. I'm gonna warn and override all the users and the CEO can do whatever he pleases, type of thing, all right? Some vendors are last app installed. So I don't warn you, it's whatever you install last is what you get, sorry. And some of the guys claim they can actually virtualize the app so both can run at the same time, okay? Well, that sounds ideal to me. Um, I haven't seen it in practice. Um, but that one sounds ideal to me. And there's one vendor that just says it's unmanaged. I don't know what'll happen. You, you can ask me for rights to install user installed apps, but I don't know what'll happen when you do install them. Uh, all of these vendors are here at Brightman, or were until noon today. The one vendor, this is what he told me. All right, you're smart enough to install it once. You're smart enough to install it again, you know? So that's what we mean by when we say unmanaged. What am I doing on time? Am I good? All right. <laughs> yeah, somebody layered a clicker in there and I got the wrong uh, one. I'm at the wrong altitude. Yeah, I'm at the wrong altitude. All right, what else do we do? All right, did I cover everything? Did you guys go uh, see Citrix's presentation the other day? Um, I saw this tweet in here um, from this guy. 
Uh, I said Citrix, I'm sorry. He used to work for Citrix. AppSense, I'm sorry. I noticed, I don't know if anybody else noticed this, but I noticed the snarkiness of presenters goes up significantly based on how much time they spend with Brian. So <laughs> you're with Brian for three days and you get really snarky and you tweet like this that says the layering vendors are closer to ghost. All right. So I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that there's also ways to do this in user mode. Okay. API interception. So that reg query API that I was talking about, you can intercept that. And trampolining, and I'll explain what trampolining is, and also something called detours. Detours is a commercially available product that you'll also want to make sure if your vendors are doing user mode, they're using this product. Let's see how that works. You have to have a DLL or some type. You have to be within the user space of that application. And what it does is it intercepts the registry and file APIs right there. And one of the other benefits you get is if you're an app that isn't allowed in user mode to write to HK local machine, it can capture that and write it off to a safe area. Same as if you're an application that writes to C backslash access dot MDB, and that is verboten in Windows 7, you could capture it with these registry interception APIs. Talk to your vendor. If he's doing user mode interception and he's not using this tool, you don't want his product. Why? Somebody tell me why. Remember the problem we got with FileMon and RegMon? We get that same problem with API interception. So I intercept load library, then you come along and intercept load library, and I don't know how to uninstall my pieces anymore. So this product from Microsoft um, you can get a copy of it free if you ever want to play with this. It's, it, it, it's pretty cool. You can get a copy of it free. Commercial use, they charge you a fee. And within it, it knows of all the other apps that are in, all the other DLLs that are in the app, and it coordinates the detouring of all the APIs together so that you won't get into the situation. So. Jump into, this is a, uh, a dump from uh, Reg Query EX. Whatever push, move, push, EDX, any of those things, it's not really important. Just to tell you that right there, you have instructions that are at the beginning of the Reg Query EX function. All right? And when you are, you can write this yourself or your detours, you create some pace and you create a trampoline function right here. So you've created, allocated some memory within this application. And you copy those first set of instructions down here, all right? And then you go into Reg Query EX and say, this is a function to give me control, my Reg Query EX, and then when I come back from it, I'm gonna jump to here plus five, all right? Or that's the label of five bytes into it. So. The trampoline now looks like this. You can see down here, he's gonna jump to that location when he's done. My Reg Query EX looks like this, okay? I do all my layering stuff, so I read, I get wherever I want to, and then I come over here and call the trampoline, but don't hold down the button there, hold on. Right. I call it right here, and it looks something like this, right? This gets called first, so when RegEdit or your application says, tell me the contents of this HK local machine um, flag. You get control. My Reg Query EX gets control, does all its code that it needs to handle the layering, then goes to the trampoline function, which if you look, everybody names the trampoline the old Reg Query EX. So they, as you program, you say, all right, I got mine, I'm gonna call the old one. The old one comes over here, and grabs those first set of bytes, which were overwritten by your jump, and then goes on to the real reg query EX. So the techniques are these, okay? 
you're a device driver in kernel mode, you do have admin privilege there uh, for certain things. Um, you have to be installed, you're gonna have to be an agent. Um, you're just not gonna do this stuff without being an agent. And I wanna make one comment on the support for other OS's here. Um, in user mode, uh, you don't need an agent. I could install this stuff into the app and you'll see there are some of these virtualization guys, that's their claim to fame, right? I can get this onto your application, uh, onto your system, without requiring the user to be an administrator to run this stuff. Um, the only problem is they can't do that for the operating system itself, right? It's only for applications and above. All right, so the support for other OSs. I've heard this all week. Yeah, but layering can't do Mac. And we can do Mac. That's only because you chose to do Mac and you've written some code to do Mac. The code that you store outside of the operating system, the layer, whatever you want to call it, is in a format that you can read on Mac. So if a layering company wants to come out with a Mac version, he's just going to have to put VHD equivalents that he can read out in Mac. What they should say is that their technique, while maybe not better than the other technique, is the first one that supports other operating systems. So just keep that in mind. What the vendors will tell on each other, you know, and they'll say, oh, you don't want to go with that solution because you'll be precluded from ever going to Windows. What you really ought to do is talk to that vendor solution and find out what the roadmap is. I mean, ever go into Macintosh. Talk to them and find out what their roadmap is. Okay, so I'll wrap her up here. This isn't just something that the layering guys can do. Anybody can write these, take advantage of these filter drivers. It's, uh, you plunk down your 10 grand, you can buy detours. Be wary of any vendor that's using the obsolete techniques. I think, um, I'm hoping my goal of this session was be that you can now go to your vendor and ask them, are you using user mode or, or kernel mode techniques? If you're using kernel mode, are you a block or file system driver? If you're user mode, you know, are you using detours? Again, are you a mini filter as opposed to a legacy driver? I'd ask anybody this. I don't care what they do. Does your software require a reboot? You annoy the hell out of me if you do. Oh, you can download Rootkit Revealer for any of your um, homegrown Mac. Is your internal IT staff have a copy of FAMON or Regmon and decided to do something with this? Um, one of the functions that you can do, there's all these process create, process first, process next functions that you can get inside in the Rootkit Revealer. We'll tell you if you've done this, you could, as the function is enumerating all the processes in the system, you could choose to skip over yours so that task manager doesn't know your process is there. Google Sony DRM and see how Mark Racinovich, Chicago, figured this out on his own system and forced Sony a uh, big public embarrassment about they put digital rights management on your commuter without your permission when you went to load a CD on your drive. And they did it by hiding every, they put all their stuff in a, a directory and then used the rootkit, the old file bond technique, to not let you see that directory no matter where, you know, whenever you, um, uh, even if you were administrator mode, they hid it from you. Did your vendor go to interop or plugfest? Uh, this is a big one. I, just in general, how does your vendor handle conflicts? Is it one of the list in there? You know, are you the wild, wild west? Or are you policy based? Or uh, how do you handle it? They support user installed apps, is a, a, a big question. And do they support single instance storage? And do they support physical? Did I, at the beginning I asked that, who also supports physical? Yeah? Did anyone raise their hand when I asked that? Yeah, you did, okay. I got a few minutes left, are there any questions? Anybody? 
If not, thank you very much. I'll stand up here for a little while too if you want to.